Welcome Osher at Dartmouth members and residents of the Upper Valley who are joining us today. I am Bill Sullivan, the president of Osher at Dartmouth, and I am pleased to bring you this special presentation from our 2017 summer lecture series, which addressed global challenges confronting the United States. Today's lecture, Cyber Warfare and Cyber Defense, was one of the special presentations of that series. The speaker is Chris Inglis, who is widely regarded as a preeminent expert on cyber issues of national concern. At the onset, let me provide you with my definition of the term cyber. To me, it means all of the activities that take place in the world of digital information communications technologies. This encompasses computers, servers, networks, Wi-Fi, and all forms of communications of and storage of data. It is important to understand that the lifetime of data in the cyber world is basically infinite, and that includes our personal data. Today's presenter, Chris Inglis, served from 2006 to 2014 as the Deputy Director of the National Security Agency. That is a position that is equivalent of the Chief Operations Officer of a major national and highly technical cooperation. Since retirement from the National Security Agency, Mr. Inglis has been in high demand uh, by the US government and by the private world for his expertise on the cyber issues. He, has, he is currently a member of the Defense Science Board and he serves on the Strategic Advisory Board of the Strategic Operations Command. He is also a member of the board of six different U.S. companies and corporations. And currently, he is a commissioner on the U.S. Cyberspace Symposium Commission, which recently released its report advocating a new national plan to ensure effective cyber defense for the United States. In Mr. Inglis's 2017 present presentation we are highlighting today, he describes the nature of cyberspace, what it is and what takes place within it. He follows that with illustrations of the nature of the worldwide cyber activities and what is at risk for the United States in the conduct of its governmental and commercial businesses <clears throat> and for us personally. Finally, Mr. Inglis makes recommendations for a cyber defense strategy for the United States. Following Mr. Inglis's presentation, I will briefly refer to the recommendations of the U.S. Cyber Symposium Commission which largely follows the recommendations that Mr. Inglis makes in the presentation today. I encourage you to listen carefully, for your cyberspace is also vulnerable, and there is much to learn here. I will talk to you at the end, and hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. It's at moments like this you wish your children to hear that they're paying attention. <laughs> All right, so. No, no pressure. Um, so those of you who haven't had a chance to turn your phone off, if you would just hold that up, point that towards me, I'd be happy to turn that off for you now. <laughs> of course, of course, of course I can't do that anymore, right? So. It is a, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first time at Dartmouth, um, kind of at this august age. I should have been here much sooner, uh, but I've certainly heard about the institution and NSA has benefited. Other organizations that I've been with have benefited from the expertise that is generated here and in other places up in this region, and so it's a delight, a pleasure to finally get here. I understand some number of you saw a movie on Stuxnet last, uh, last week. How many of those? Great. Um, so, so I imagine you had the same feeling I did when I saw Jaws, the movie Jaws, 30 years ago. <laughs> so I saw the movie Jaws. I was about a million miles. It was Colorado Springs where I saw this movie. 
And, and when I got back to the campus, the Air Force Academy campus, I, I was so impressed with the movie, I would only stay on the sidewalks. I would not walk on the grass. <laughs> right? so, so completely irrational, but nonetheless, um, kind of um, well-earned fear. So we'll talk a little today about what's true, what's not in terms of those trends. Um, I don't think that we should have irrational fear, but we should have a concern. We should understand what's really possible and what's actually going on in that space. And that's my job, I think, for the first 50 minutes or so, is to perhaps lay some of that out. In so doing, what I'm going to try to do is to describe a little bit about the nature of the space, what I call cyberspace, that deserves an explanation as to what is cyberspace. But I'll lay that out, talk a little bit about the nature of it. I'll lay something out about the nature of the actions that are taking place in that space and why we care, what things are at risk in that space. And I will suggest, at least at a strategy level, the things that we should be doing in that space, whether as individuals, organizations, private sector, public sector, governments, plural. Um, there are some things that are well-worn traditions and protocols in our other domains of interest, whether that's in diplomacy or in the traditional land, air, sea, um, that we can drag into this space, but we'll find that cyberspace is unique in some ways, and we have to actually undertake some new thinking. And so I'll try to lay all that out, hopefully as a basis for a rich dialogue, whether it's out there on the lawn or back in here under the glare of the Klieg lights. If you'll permit me, I'd like to start with a joke. I know that's just terrible bad form, but I was trained by the Air Force. I have PowerPoint slides and jokes. Uh, <clears throat> so as Bill indicated in the uh, introduction, I was an Air Force pilot for quite some time. I was able, I was pleased to be able to fly something um, generated by the military once a week for the better part of over 26 years, meaning I was happy once. Um, and, and for a long period of time, I flew this thing called a C-141. Now, no, those of you not familiar with the, uh, the kind of aircraft uh, that's flown by the United States Air Force, that was a long time ago. It had technology that dated back to the 1650s. It had a sextant <laughs> on board. Um, but it was a four-engine airplane about the size of a uh, Boeing 707, and it was the workhorse, the backbone of the global strategic uh, airlift community. And so we went everywhere. Um, and, and as anybody who's flown airplanes before knows, is that the most dangerous period of flight is typically either the takeoff or the landing, but the takeoff because you're just ginning up and you really don't have a feel for the airplane. And, and the most expensive part of the flight is takeoff through the climb up to altitude. And so in this joke, this is an anecdote, a joke, so don't take this too seriously. But in this joke, um, we take off one day on a transcontinental flight, um, or I'd say a transoceanic flight. We take off and we kind of push the power up. Everything's working fine. Um, you get to that magic moment where you break ground and now you're struggling, kind of expending all of this energy. The engines are struggling forward to climb up to altitude. That's where most of your energy is expended. You get up to altitude on four engines and you're cruising along. And what you're next thinking about is getting to what's called the equal time point. That's the place from which there's no return. Right? You do not have the gas, you do not have the energy to make it back. And so whatever happens, you're going forward. And at this moment in time, up at altitude, cruising over the Atlantic, the Azores somewhere out in front of you, uh, passing the equal time point, we lose an engine. Engine fails. Um, for pilots, uh, this is a dirty little secret, for pilots, that's a, that's a moment of great and positive excitement. <laughs> because you have something to do, all right? So, 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 so you go through all the drill necessary to shut the engine down and to render it harmless, safe, you know, kind of separated from all the other systems on the airplane. And then you have to actually account for the fact that you've lost this energy, so you have to reduce the power. Uh, it sounds paradoxical. When you reduce the power, you want to go a little bit slower to achieve a more optimal flight profile and go down to a lower altitude because you don't have the power necess necessary to sustain that. And so in the vernacular um, you know, of the moment, you then announce to passengers and crew, lost an engine, not a problem. We have four engines so that we can fly on three. Um, we'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower, but we'll make it just fine. Now, as this story goes, uh, they then subsequently lose a second engine. Pilots excited, perhaps not positively excited. This might be a trend. Um, but he goes through the same drill and he announces to passengers and crew, that's why we have four engines. We can fly on two because we're already up at altitude. We've expended most of our energy. We'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower, but we'll make it. Um, you can tell where the story's going. <laughs> They lose a third engine, right? So the pilot, not, he's not excited at all at this moment in time. He's very concerned, right? He's now kind of, you know, gripping the reality. Um, but he goes through the drill and he says, we're going to be a little bit lower, a little bit slower, and we're probably now looking for a destination short of the one we'd intended. But he announces to the crew, we'll be fine. We've got four engines because we can make it on one since we're already up at altitude, but we'll be a little bit lower, a little bit slower. At this point, one of the passengers looks at another passenger and says, well, hope we don't lose the last engine, because if we do, we'll be up here all day. <laughs> so, so, 
Now, I tell that story because all of you knew, all of you knew the wisdom of that observation is that, you know, the person seeing what happens when you lose one or two or three, this is the logical knock-on sequence, right? Uh, now, when we look at cyberspace, we have a similar, right, problem. We're, so we're seeing what's happening at the surface level. We think we therefore can extrapolate that into what that means. And unless you actually rip the cover off that box and understand what's happening underneath, you might be misled about what perhaps the safeties or the risks, the challenges, or the opportunities in that space might be. Which is why I think we need to go a little bit more deeply than you might otherwise want to about what the true nature of cyberspace is. I teach at the United States Naval Academy. The kids that show up there are just as nobly intended, just as bright, just as full of potential as the ones that show up at Dartmouth and other colleges that are on this link. Um, but as opposed to our expectations that they are digital natives, having been raised in the midst of this stuff, they're not. They're app natives, right? They really don't know how the systems work because we've made it such that they don't need to. Apple, Google, others have succeeded beyond their wildest dreams, making these systems so intuitive that you simply kind of touch the screen in a way that makes sense to you as a human being and the screen performs. The software underneath does what it's supposed to do. Or you stuff data, your dear secrets, into this system and you assume that it's being protected um, the system doesn't often unpleasantly surprise you, so that assumption kind of is extrapolated into perhaps grander assumptions about the safety security of critical systems, those that generate water, those that generate distributed electricity, and so on and so forth. And so we find at the U.S. Naval Academy we need to step back and say, first and foremost, we need to tell you a little bit about what's really happening under, underfoot. Um, when you kind of see a glossy, what we used to call a table magazine, sort of a coffee book, uh, coffee table book, and, and you see this glossy picture on the front, and you wipe the face of that, and it doesn't go immediately to the second page. It's not broken, right? <laughs> so, so, so it turns out that the technology underneath, you know, actually has a function, and there's some depth of that function. And if you understand that, you'll understand the consequences of that. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to walk you through some of that. Um, because my assessment, and I'm now in the private sector doing some work there, I do a lot of defense work. I still, on a pro bono basis, do defense science board studies, things of that sort teach at the Naval Academy, and looking across the expanse of the private and public sector, in the realm of cyberspace, again, I've not yet defined what that is, so I will, but in the realm of cyberspace, my sense is there are some really well-framed, well-formed best practices. But by and large, as a society, organizations, we are still defending the wrong thing in the wrong time, holding the wrong people accountable, uh, focused on the wrong goal, and perhaps sometimes hysterical about the wrong problem. Otherwise, as I tell my students, you've only missed straight A's by three B's and a D. I will explain through the rest of the talk why I think this is true and why, therefore, we're not necessarily focused on the right goals, holding the right people accountable, and what I think I mean by we need to focus on perhaps a different objective and essentially collaborate and integrate in a different way. But let's first go through some history. Um, people think that the, anybody know what this is? It's an Enigma machine, right? Anybody seen the uh, imitation game? It's a fantastic movie. Not enough American accents in the movie for my liking, but, um, but all the same, a pretty good movie and a pretty true telling of the story. Um, so this, of course, is a box, a device that tries to, in an electromechanical form, replicate some mathematics that would take a message in plain form, scramble that so that you can send that across to shortwave radio link, and then on the other end of that, telegrapher does that work in between, on the other end of that, using the same box set up the same way, you could recover the message. You could take the scrambled message and recover what is, whatever is underneath that. Now, this was built and, and operated by the German Wehrmacht, right? You can tell that this is a German army machine because it's got three rotors in there. If it had four rotors in there, it would be a German Navy machine. Um, but this, at the height of World War II, was communicating all manner of things around the Axis powers to essentially command ships at sea to show up in certain places, submarines to show up in certain places, armies to undertake certain maneuvers. And this, in my view, was the earliest instance that I'm familiar with of the true nature of the cyber war. Because the Germans, and, and on the other side of the planet, the Japanese, assumed that this system was safe because they had absolute high confidence in the technology underneath this. Of course, the system wasn't safe, as history will recall, because we actually broke the system, not the box. Because if you see the movie, you realize about a third of the way through the movie that Alan Turing, the hero of the movie, pulling his hair out, says the box is actually pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's actually so good. The math in it is so good. The box is electromechanically so well designed that we can't break the box. But they came to the conclusion that we just might break them. 
we just might, in a brain-on-brain -brain game, outwit the Germans. We might outwit the Japanese, the Axis powers, in their use of this, their assumptions of how it works, perhaps the mistakes that they might make, we might catch them in those. They might exercise some hubris, some arrogance. And so when I say this is what broke the Enigma system, I'm not pointing to the machine, I'm pointing to the person. She and people like her, that's what broke the German Enigma system. We assumed that they would make mistakes. We caught them in those mistakes. Those mistakes were fatal. And the audacity of the British, the Americans, the Five Eyes, the Australians, the Canadians, the Poles assisting us, the audacity of that group of people at a place called Bletchley Park in assuming that they could break that system and then in undertaking the necessary mental capacity to do so, shortened by most historians' view, the war by two years saved hundreds of thousands of uniform lives, let alone untold disaster across those battlefields. But there was an equally audacious proposition that took place side by side. The Americans and the others, but the Americans and the Allied forces had their own system. Whereas the German system was called the Enigma system, we had a system called Sagaba. And if you looked at it, aside from the different form, slightly different form, it had rotors, it had electromechanical parts, it was largely the same system. Turns out that there's not a conspiracy between the Egyptians and the Mexicans to build pyramids 4,000 years ago using alien um, assistance. If you pile up rocks any other way, they fall down, right? So, so it turns out that in this day, right, these systems are largely the same because that was the state of the art. But we were audacious enough on the defense to think that we could defend that system. Our adversaries weren't audacious enough to think that they could attack that system. And most historians say that our ability to communicate securely between ourselves, especially in the early days of the war when we didn't have the logistics or the tactics, shortened that war by two or three years and saved a greater number of lives than the offense. Defense is as important in this endeavor as is offense, and it's a brain game. It's more a brain game than it is a technology game, and I'll make that point again and again. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening in this space. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of insights, perhaps through a soda straw, about things that are happening in the space, again, before I define what the space itself is. If you look out on the internet under a, a website called informationisbeautiful.com, and you search on that website for a thing called breaches, computer breaches, cyber breaches, you'll get a chart that looks like this. And what this represents, sorted two ways, um, what this represents is all of the breaches that have occurred in cyberspace of some consequence on a global basis. And it, it will allow you to sort this two ways. First, you can say, I want to see the sectors that have been impacted, financial sector, government sector, military sector, banking sector, academic. I want to see all of the um, implications of this, all of the consequences. And the second way it lets you sort this is I want to see all the causes. So I want to see the causes that are attributable to, say, a human error, to a technology, et cetera, et cetera. So I've now turned on both right, of these, the little chart on the right-hand side. This is actually an interactive chart, but I've got a static picture of it. And so I've said, I want to see all of the causes, that's down below, and I want to see all of the consequences. Those are the sectors that have been impacted. A lot of bubbles up there. And, and they're bubbles that if you could see them close in, you'd say, oh, I recognize that one. The Target, the Home Depot, the Office of Management and Budget, the, st the theft of 21 million federal records, they're all up there. So I'm going to now show you the chart when I turn off one thing. What I'm going to do is turn off the causes attributable to technology, meaning I'm going to show you all impacts and only those causes attributable to humans. Don't blink. That's it. <laughs> now, for those of you that were paying very rapt and close attention, there's a very small bubble in the upper right-hand corner that just disappeared, right? It was attributable wholly, solely to technology fault. Every other one of the bubbles up there, every other one of the breaches is attributable to what? Human error, human malfeasance, human mistake, human hubris, human arrogance. Right? That's going to be a theme throughout the talk. Um, so this is a denial of service attack. I'll explain what that is in a second. That occurred between 2012, 2013. 200 different days across that time frame, um, somebody, some group of somebody's got up in the world and constituted what's called a denial of service attack against banks, financial institutions, largely quartered in the United States, but it's a globally interconnected system and so it's spread to a lot of other places. Now what's a denial of service attack? In practical terms, a denial of service attack is like having your front door at your house attacked with Nerf balls. Somebody's got a bazillion Nerf balls and they're throwing those Nerf balls at the front door. They don't harm the front door. They don't destroy, destruct, um, otherwise permanently kind of damage the front door, but they make it impossible for you to find it, right? Such that when you want to legitimately get into your house, you can't because it's obscured. 
Denial of service attack might be, if you're trying to log on to a website, say it's bankofamerica.com, denial of service attack would be hurling requests at that website to, hey, let me log on without credentials. It tries to then service that request. It tries to say, do you have a credential? Do you have a password? You don't. It then ignores you, but it does that trillions of times a second such that you can't get to that front door. That's a denial of service attack. When it stops and the Nerf balls blow away and the sun shines again, the bank is no worse for the wear, except there's been an opportunity cost in between where its legitimate customers have not been able to get access to their accounts, financial transfers haven't occurred. The opportunity costs are significant, severe in some cases, because the customers themselves lose confidence in that front door and say, maybe I'm going to take my business elsewhere. On this chart, if you're a blue dot, you're receiving those Nerf balls. You're essentially a victim of attack. And if you're a large blue dot, it's a pretty severe attack. If you're a red dot, you're hurling the Nerf balls. Right? And if it's a large red dot, you're hurling a lot of Nerf balls. If you're a yellow dot on this chart, then you're a piece of a global infrastructure, computers around the world that have essentially been taken hostage by whoever's doing this, such that at a moment's notice, you can turn into a red dot and begin to hurl these bots. It's a very dynamic, very flexible, very creative, clever system. Now, the question that I would ask, this is a, at the moment this was created, a top secret chart created by NSA using all sorts of you know, secret methods, um, all legitimate, all done by the rule of law. We'll talk about that later. Um, but it was classified in those days because the means by which it was derived in real time was classified. But I would ask you, looking at this very accurate chart, who's doing this? Who's up to no good in this, in this particular endeavor? You're right, the Iranians. It's as plain as the nose on your face. <laughs> you can see it. Just jumps right off the chart at you. Turns out it's really hard to see. Because if you don't actually understand what the second and third order aspects of this are, if you can't penetrate beneath the fabric to try to put together who's who in the zoo, it's almost impossible to determine. And this is a problem today because people who are the victims of this and say, I just want to do something, look out and see what is perceived to be the aggressor only to find that they're going to go back after somebody that themselves is a victim in an earlier phase of this attack. And the Iranians did this 200 different days between 2012 and 2013. They themselves might say that they weren't the provocateurs in this. They were simply responding to some provocation that occurred elsewhere, right across the great uh, long arc of history. That's an issue. We'll talk a little bit about that. This next one, um, you've all seen this. Um, you know, it turns out that in the upper left-hand corner, that's not Edward Snowden. That's the actor playing Edward Snowden. But there are two actors up on this, uh, this chart. Um, Edward Snowden, the other actor in this case, he's in the lower right-hand corner. I mention this not to actually challenge the ideological premise. We can talk about that in the Q&A if you want, but rather to say that there are many kinds of threats in this world. There are the kinds of threats that were indicated by those breaches where aggressors are actually stealing your data, perhaps holding your data at risk, the ransomware attacks encrypting your data so you can't get access to it, destruction, theft, denial. There's the second kind, which is the Nerf balls of the world, which is essentially trying to disrupt it for some period of time. And then there are people who have extraordinary insider privilege who abuse those privileges for whatever reason. It might be ideological, might just be because they're just having a bad day. But all of these constitutes threats to your otherwise good use of the system. Your expectations, the system's going to be there for your benefit, um, is disrupted, perhaps challenged, by the existence of all of these. So let's back up, if those in fact are some representation of the threats, to say, why do we care about this space? What's actually in this space in the first place? Why does this matter to us? I'm going to do that two ways. One, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the tangible aspects, tangible components of the space. Most of this won't surprise you, but perhaps I'll tease out some things that might be um, kind of consequences of the way the space is built that do surprise you. That's my job. Um, and, and then secondly, I'll talk a little bit about the things that are happening alongside that exacerbate or compound this. So if when I joined... A, NSA, 1985, somebody had said, what is the internet? I would have said, I have no earthly idea. Um, but, but after a long kind of series of perhaps uh, Socratic questions, somebody got me to say, what is it today, 1985? This was it. In 1985, there was a telecommunications system, largely of a manual nature, such that there were links that would connect devices um, around the world, and using either a telephone that you in those days dialed, or a fax machine that you could in those days begin to punch buttons on, or a telegraphy um, unit that you could send things across shortwave radio link, you could cause communications to flow from one point to another. Largely manual affair, meaning the human being had to take some tangible, discrete action in order to get that communication to flow. So that's property one. Largely humans are in charge, still in charge. Um, thing two is that it was a very transient thing. Communications didn't live in this space, they simply transited this space. 
right? They simply, from point A to point B, would make their way across. If you wanted to hold those communications at risk, your NSA in World War II trying to hold the Wehrmacht at risk, that was your moment in time. You needed to catch it while it was going from A to B. If you didn't, game was over, right? If you were defending that communication, you only needed to defend it between points A and B. But the third thing, the third characteristic, is the thing that's been remarkable in terms of the consequences ever since, which is that because that was only in that space from point A to point B, it wasn't permanently retained by that space, and therefore there was no permanent kind of instantiation of that thing, that communication in that space, and therefore we were not tempted to have that be the only representation of the material value it represented. Let me be clear about that. Right? In those days, a communication typically reflected something happening in the outside world and almost never represented the representation, these, the unique and sole representation, re representation of that thing in the space itself. I had a bank account when I was a small child in this day and age, um, and that bank account was represented typically by what was called a passbook. And if the passbook had not been certified or stamped to have a certain amount of money associated with it, if there wasn't some greenbacks, some currency that actually was represented physically in that space, I didn't have any money. Today, my money is represented by ones and zeros that are stored in this space. There's no other representation of that. I might get occasionally a physical, graphical, right, kind of instantiation of that, but the principal way that that money is represented is ones and zeros in that space. How did that change? Well, remember that this space increasingly had these very sophisticated devices attached to the edge of it, not just the old dumb telephone instruments that we knew as children, um, but these things that had some smarts embedded in them, right, that had some ability to do things that exceeded your expectations. Uh, this is when the kind of video cassette recorders came in and were blinking 12 maddeningly at us all the time. It, it needed something more. It had some function that it tried to execute. Um, but what really then happened somewhere in the early 1990s was those devices became sufficiently powerful that we could actually offload to them the choice of how to communicate the thing that we wanted to send at what time and in what way, using what pipes. That's your problem. I don't want to worry about that anymore. And when that began to happen, we inserted this layer, this kind of this layer in between that doesn't really exist, but it's there for all practical purposes, logic layer, where the system began to take on some function on our behalf. It said, I'll figure this out for you. I'll tell you how that's going to get there from point A to point B. Matter of fact, I won't tell you. I'll just do it. I'll just exceed your expectations. And then beyond that, began to say, tell you what, since the person that you want to communicate with isn't awake now, you're in America, they're in Korea, I'll just hold it inside the system until such time as they come calling for it. That was, in my view, when I first heard of email, the miracle of email. It wasn't that it could find anybody on the planet. We've been able to do that forever. It was that it would retain this stuff inside of itself, wherever the devil that was, and essentially it would wait for you. We began to store stuff in the space. That's when we were tempted then to say, well, darn, if this is a great repository, why do I have another version of this thing in the outside world? I'll just store it in the cyberspace. And so cyberspace took on a fundamentally different character, despite the fact that it was once a telecommunications domain where, hey, somebody steals my communication, I still have this stuff. Now the stuff is only in cyberspace. But here's the real deal, which is all of that was being developed in a context that had bookends, bookends of people on the one side, that's the whole point of domains of interest on the planet Earth, people on the one side who have inherent characteristics, either aspirations or rights, inalienable rights in our society, um, and on the other end, geography. Why is geography important? Not just because of its physical reality of how things get from one place to another on the planet Earth, but geography is typically where we define jurisdictions. We come up with rule sets. We apply those rule sets. And these two bookends have some expectations based on our prior experience about what happens in the middle. But these bookends, if we extend them kind of absolutely into this space, will break our heart. Um, there are, at this moment in time, I think probably 3.6 billion people making use of the Internet, not literally at this moment in time. Uh, but on a daily basis, 3.6 billion people or so. That's a pretty healthy proportion of the world's population. But at this moment in time, there are about 4 or 5 billion persona in, in cyberspace. What's a persona? That's actually something that represents itself as being um, kind of a thinking, sensing creature. Um, that is something that you might perceive as a human being in that space. Um, but when you actually do the mapping back to an actual person, some of those persona map back to, you know, multiple persona map back to one person. And so the relationship between what you see in cyberspace and what actually exists in the real world is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, and it's oftentimes a fake relationship. Um, in, in the world of uh, the dark space, which is an internet that essentially is outside of our typical daily view, but it's 100 times bigger than the visible space, um, by most estimates, it's only possible to figure out what the true identity is of about 1% of the characters, the persona that are operating in that space. 
So that's an issue up on that top layer. Bottom layer is even more pernicious. If you ask someone, I ask the midshipmen this all the time, how does a communication in cyberspace get from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States? They all go, I've taken geography, that's an easy question. I'll take that question because the next one now is going to be hard. It turns out this is the trick question. They say um, that communication leaves the east coast of the United States, proceeds on a westerly heading, a couple of milliseconds later gets to California, 3,000 miles. Next question, please. Turns out cyberspace knows that's not necessarily the right answer. Why? Because cyberspace knows that at this moment in an American day, people are waking up all across the country. Cats are playing piano on YouTube, right? You know, hand over fist. Uh, Breitbart and all manner of other news feeds are beginning to kind of populate our bias. Um, and, and so the pipes are clogged, enormously clogged, between here and San Francisco. So it turns out cyberspace says the more intelligent answer might be, let's assume that people have gone to bed in places like Europe, Asia, and such, and those pipes are perhaps less clogged. We'll send that communication east. We'll send it across the Atlantic, Europe, Asia, and we'll get it to San Francisco. Maybe not as fast as it would on a clean line, but faster than if it has to contend with the clog lines. And so that's what it does. Now, if that communication is an order from Washington, D.C. to some submarine base in, uh, in Oregon, to essentially deploy four submarines out to monitor the east coast of North Korea, um, and you assume that because it's traversed right those two points inside the United States, that it's safe, that it's inside your garrison, it's inside a sanctuary, you might be surprised to find out that all manner of people have been able to look at that communication as it races underfoot around the world, and so on and so forth. All sorts of consequences derive from not understanding how that really works. Put all these things together and you get the true nature of cyberspace, and I don't mean to complicate the affair, but to say that most solutions that people bring to bear in cyberspace talk about one of these layers. They say, well, let's solve the people issue, or let's solve the device issue, let's solve the link issue. As opposed to solving all of these, this is a vertical space. A person connected to many devices who makes use of that autonomous logic layer connected to the links, who actually has some place in the world, some jurisdictions that then pertain, that's what actually is happening in any particular engagement in cyberspace. And unless you think about all of those at once, atomically bound another, um, you're destined to fail. Now I'll simplify that a bit. Um, so I'm going to bottom line say that I think cyberspace is essentially the meld, the atomic binding of technology and people and what I might call procedure, the things that essentially kind of are the expected activities between the two. The distinction that I'm really trying to get to is that when people say it's just a pile of technology, it's just a commodity, it's just like the motor pole, can't we just get the technology to bend to our purpose, they're misperceiving what the real deal is, which is that people are an integral part of this. The Wehrmacht, the Japanese Empire, didn't understand that World War II and lived to regret it. We continue to this day to think that if we just double down on the technology investments, they're important, but that if we just do that and that alone, that we'll get this just fine but people are the weak link. When somebody comes after you in cyberspace, more often than not, they're coming after you. They're not coming after your smartphone. They're not coming after some piece of software that you're using. Now, there might be what's called a zero-day vulnerability in the mix, but they're looking for you to have not patched it. They're looking for you to misunderstand its use. They're looking for you to take some risk, to exercise some arrogance, to perhaps make, an, make a mistake. You know, when the Russians presumably went after the Democratic National Committee, um, they weren't after some inanimate object or a server. They were trying to get somebody to make a mistake, somebody to click on a link that they shouldn't have, somebody to do something that then constituted the weak link in that system so that they could then steal those emails and use them for some ulterior motive. The human was the weak link in that. So what then do we do about that? Well, I think we have to put the technology in a context, and so I would say the following about technology, because then I'm going to talk about some other trends that essentially compound this. First, the technology creates dependencies that in turn create existential risks. If you are dependent upon the resilience and robustness of the bits that flow in this infrastructure, the data in this infrastructure, to generate your power, to cause that power to flow, to perhaps properly charge power for that power, and that dependency is not well understood and not well defended, that can become an existential risk for your society. So we need to think about that. Second, the innovation in this space occurs at the edge. That's where the royal is taking place as individuals use technology in ways that hadn't been anticipated, as individuals perhaps use software um, in ways that the underlying technology wasn't designed for, that innovation is rich and ongoing and takes place at the edge in a way that exceeds our expectations in all the positive ways. We will solve cancer because you've got literally hundreds of millions of people combining their efforts at the edge to make use of these technologies, the software, the data inside of it, in very profound and valuable ways. It can't be controlled by the center. 
but the mission assurance that we're looking for um, in terms of is it resilient, is it robust, is not one and the same as the technology assurance that is often guaranteed by the technology providers. Technology provider will say, I guarantee this thing will be on and it will pass bits. I won't guarantee that the human component of this or that the mission assurance, that is the competence you have, that it's going to work under all conditions, I can't guarantee that because that's dependent upon things I, the technologist, can't control. Applications and all the purposes are open-ended, multiplying things that can and do wrong. Um, most computers that we have, even your cell phone increasingly, are what's called general purpose computing devices, meaning that you can put just about any kind of an app on it to do something new and different um, that, that you might not have thought about last week. It's open-ended in terms of its purpose. There are embedded processors that are kind of idiot savants. They might live in your refrigerator, and they, all they do is they turn the, kind of pre the compressor on at the given temperature or the given condition, and therefore have very limited function. It's hard to make them go wrong. Unless, of course, we start to consider computers, um, uh, or we start to think of refrigerators and stoves and dishwashers as general purpose computers and perhaps begin to work software there and have them do things that exceed our expectations. That open-ended nature makes it such that that makes it more complicated in ways that aren't helpful. And here's the bottom line, adversaries are ever-present. I tell my kids at the Naval Academy, I say, this is not Y2K um, repeated. Now, they all look at me and say, what is Y2K? <laughs> um, so it's a good question. Um, most of us in the audience probably remember Y2K. That was that moment in time when we'd created a whole bunch of software in the 1960s. And remember, the 1960s, uh, the processors weren't that big, the software was very cumbersome and, and, and not that terribly uh, overperforming. And so when we came to actually encode right, the year for, for a particular application, we said numbers, spaces inside this are very expensive. So as opposed to putting in 1954, a great year, by the way, as opposed to putting in 1954, let's just say 54. We all know that's 1954. We'll save two, bit, two, two bits in this, actually many more bits, two characters in this, and, and we'll be the better for it. And we said, and if the year 2000 ever comes, oh my God, that will never come, right? But, <laughs> but if the year 2000 ever comes, we will have replaced this technology with one after another after another, not realizing it's just a continuous development of the same technology base. And so now the year 2000 is hoving into view, and we're thinking we might wake up one day, and all the computers will say, it's not the year 2000, it's the year 1900. Computers didn't exist. We should all just turn off and go to sleep. And all of our critical processes stop. And, and so we fixed that. We worked our tails off for the better part of five years before the year 2000 to fix that. And it became a non-event. Right? Now, that's not what's going on today. That was a technology issue. It was one of our own creation. And there weren't people actively um, kind of interfering with our attempt to fix it. This is different. Right? This is not just a technology issue. I've already made the case that this is a human issue. And there are adversaries who are actively conspiring to interdict our efforts to fix this thing. So we can't just lock it down and say, everybody, kind of, let's fire a gun, get everybody out of the pool, walk around with a clipboard and take notes. Um, we can't do that because there are actually adversaries on the field. That makes this different. Um, but if you thought that was complicated enough, let me just give you four more trends. And we're going to go to solution space, I promise you. But I need to go through this, this one more thing which is that's all technology, and I've actually participated, I've perpetrated this extensive um, kind of perhaps conspiracy to say it's all about the technology, it's broken our hearts, we should just get those technologists to kind of come around and then we'll be okay. It's not that simple. There are four other trends taking place side by side with this technology, this inexorable rush of technology that actually complicate this. Uh, the first of these I've already mentioned something about, a new geography that we increasingly don't think about our opportunities and we don't exercise those opportunities using traditional geography, physical geography. We think about that increasingly using internet geography, virtual geography. I've already told you about the assumption you might make about how communication flows. That's not necessarily how cyberspace thinks of it. But think of Uber, think of Airbnb, think of Lyft, think of all those companies who at the end of a year have no physical inventory. How do they think about their markets? How do they think about the business that they're in? They think about this business of, I can find my customers by reaching out to them across this geography called the internet. I can manage their resources or somebody else's resources against their needs um, to essentially affect a profit for myself. But they have no assets other than the virtual geography of the internet itself. That makes for some profound differences in terms of how people think about the role of physical territory, the role of jurisdictions that are typically rooted in that physical territory. If you're a company operating in that new virtual geography and you have a cyber breach, you typically have to report to 54 different jurisdictions just by operating across the length and breadth of the United States. 54 states and territories all have fundamentally different notions about how that breach should be reported and how the accountability should be affected in that space because they're wed to physical geography despite the fact that there's a new geography. 
but there's something more pernicious, which is a new social order. This is the kind of increasing propensity of people to organize not by physical geography, not by proximity, physical proximity, but by ideology. Now, when I was a kid, um, my mother said I was big boned, meaning that I was, you know, about the same weight, but 12 inches shorter. Um, you know, I, my friends would have said fat and dumpy. Um, and, and I lived um, for great stretches of time in dark spaces in the basement. And, and I had two, two opportunities um, kind of staring me in the face. One was to spend the rest of my natural life down there, essentially just kind of, you know, in, in increasingly in a fetal crouch. Or I could physically get up out of the basement. I could go join the Boy Scouts. I could go to the schoolyard. I could approximate myself physically, right, to opportunities in the world, make friends or not, and essentially see my way through the rest of life. There's now a third opportunity. Because lurking in the corner of that basement is this thing called the internet. And you can reach out and touch, be touched, inspire, be inspired by people you'll never meet, causes you'll never encounter. We have a great concern in the United States, as they do in Europe, about this thing called lone wolf terrorists which is that somebody born and raised in a particular society who we think for all the world, he's one of us, she's one of us, right? So they were born in Birmingham. How could they feel anything other than, you know, they have this British um, kind of identity? Um, who one day gets up and goes out and commits murder and mayhem against their citizens. And you say, I never saw them talk to somebody that radicalized them. I never saw them approximate themselves, physically approximate themselves to something that perhaps got them to have an identity other than the one that they were born with. And this mystifies us because we don't understand that we're creating organizations, we're creating um, enterprises that have no physical instantiation. They only have an ideology and they have this way of communicating and connecting that ideology to people across the internet. I put Edward Snowden in this camp. He was an organization of one living amidst 50,000 other people. And our expectations that he would essentially feel like if he had a grievance or a gripe, he would come to that organization first as opposed to taking that outside the organization and doing enormous harm to the organization that essentially was his physical home um, was not an appropriate, was not a matched expectation with reality. Um, this is an issue for us. We need to then think, um, if you give someone privilege and your expectation is because they're physically bound to you, they're physically inside that territory, do they have an identity that says, my fealty, my loyalty be here as opposed to there, when there is also present but not visible because it's part of the virtual infrastructure. Finally, there's the continuance, there's two more, but there's the continuance of disparities. What do I mean by that? There are people who have money, people who don't. There are people who have religious respect, there are people who don't. There are societies who perhaps think that they were born lucky, kind of in a particular place or in a particular kind of um, hereditary um, kind of chain, and people who don't. And the reason I mention that is that's been the source of collaboration and competition and conflict for time immemorial. But I mention that here because those reconciliations, whether it's through one of the positive or the negative mechanisms that I just indicated, those reconciliations increasingly take place in and through cyberspace. I'll mention an example or two in a moment. And geopolitics finally continues apace. Right? There are countries who collaborate through alliances, coalitions. There are countries who compete, perhaps financially, uh, perhaps some, sometimes through proxies. And there are countries who have conflicts, but that geopolitics plays out on the world stage and increasingly, all of those are taking place in and through cyberspace. Why does Iran attack U.S. financial infrastructure 200 times 2012, 2013? Possibly because they perceive a disparity, a disparity of respect. Possibly because they're trying to reconcile a grievance they think that was imposed upon them. Possibly because there's some geopolitical play playing out, but mostly because cyberspace is for them the most efficient, effective way to reconcile that grievance. Why does right, North Korea attack Sony Pictures in and through cyberspace? Possibly for each of those last two points. But so on and so forth, increasingly we're seeing this reconciliation take place in cyberspace. So the great news is, is that cyberspace is increasingly a tool for productivity and transformation. We see it everywhere you look. Whether that's predicting weather, curing cancer, the sorts of things that give rise to the Arab Spring in 2011, where people who never met each other, didn't essentially kind of exercise physical geography, but had a common ideology, all of a sudden one day come out of their basements and out of their various quarters to the Tahir Square and, and essentially rally for this thing that from at least our perspective we say is a great unbridled good. However, side by side with that, crime has used the same mechanism, whether it's the Russian business network, whether it's the dark web, whether it's the recent ransomware attack, WannaCry, they've used the same mechanism to hold us at risk. Um, ideology, you can kind of look at Chelsea Manning, what she did, you can look at the Arab Spring, very positive. You can look at Edward Snowden, not in my view positive, ISIS, ISIL, WikiLeaks, and so on and so forth. All manner of persons who are essentially organizing by ideology and using cyberspace as a way to exercise their aspirations. 
You can look geopolitics, and I'll have a string here because I'm going to get to a place where I say that we've just reached an inflection point which I have but uh, has largely been talked about as the largest theft of, of wealth and treasure, the intellectual property theft by the Chinese from perhaps 2006-2015. Uh, um, that's taking place in this space. You've got on top of that Stuxnet in 2010. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. You've got on top of that the Iranian attacks that I've mentioned. You've got the North Korean attack on Sony Pictures. You've got the Russian attacks on the Ukrainian electrical sector, for those of you that didn't see that, December of 2015, um, we believe the Russians shut down an area the size of Texas, 220,000 customers and all, just shut the electrical system down cold. And the good news was the Ukrainians had not made their controls completely digital, meaning they still had manual ability to open right, the, those electrical systems for the flow of electricity again, and were able to do that within a few short hours. Imagine, however, an electrical system company that says, we're going all digital, all of our controls are on the network, those things are open such that the, the electricity stops flowing. They're then destroyed such that you can't reach onto that network and actually close those breakers again. And they have a denial of service attack, the Russians did all three of those things, a denial of service attack such that the responders can't respond. Imagine that happens in a place like the United States where we have no backstop, we have no manual procedures to essentially get back at that again. That's a big deal. The last thing I put on this list I put here because I think that we've just hit an inflection point, which is Russian information war on the West in, in the year 2016, and in particular an information war prosecuted against us. I think it's different in kind, and let me explain why on the following chart. I'm going to talk about information war, talk about cyber war as two different things. I'm therefore going to talk about this at three levels. At the first level, what you might say is a foundational level, uh, most computer scientists, uh, most uh, theorists, political theorists, have been thinking their way through this for the better part of 15, 20 years. They say, look, at, at an infrastructure level, when we look down and we see underneath of us these pathways, these devices, and we see people making use of them, we are clearly um, cognizant of the fact that people want to steal right, that data. That's called computer network exploitation. They might want to disrupt or destroy that data. That can be called computer network attack. But we've been watching that for 15, 20 years um, and sometimes participating in that by using that for our own intelligence and surveillance methods, sometimes participating in that by perhaps using that as another instrument of national power. But we're, we're clearly aware of that. But what really makes that important is that that actually then is directly supporting a struggle, a competition, or a conflict that's happening as a matter of abstraction at a level higher than that. It's really not about the bits. It's not about the data. It's not about the infrastructure. It's about those things that depend upon it. You know, why do the Iranians kind of do the denial of service attack on the infrastructure? Not for its own sake, because they want to shut down the bank. It's about the financial system, not about the bits, not about the infrastructure. That level of abstraction is really important, and it's direct. The flow of electricity, the flow of water, the generation of nuclear power, voting systems depend upon those bits, depend upon that infrastructure. That's a second level, a really important abstraction of the first level. And we need to get our help, head up and think about that level as we're actually thinking about the technology that lives at the first level. But in 2016, we experienced a third level, which is an attack on the confidence of a nation, an attack on the psychology of a nation. And this is not so easily abstracted from those first two levels. You have to actually stand back and really think about this, ponder this for a moment to say, were the Russians in 2016 actually just trying to steal bits from John Podesta? Of course not. They're trying to steal his emails. And was it just about the emails? that It was at that second level of abstraction. It was just about the emails. No, there's something more going on here. Was it that they were trying to change a single vote from yes to no or no to yes? You might think that. But it was actually about something more. It was at this third level, it was actually an attack on the confidence of a nation. It was an attack on us so that we might then either be distracted or perhaps turn inward and kind of take these fissures that have been bothering us for quite some time and exacerbate those and, and start an internal discussion that bordered on competition or conflict and create a democracy at war with itself. And if that's the game, then cyber plays a role, but it's not about cyber. It's about this larger, now, existential activity. And cyber is implicated in this, but it's not entirely responsible for this. It's really about the human component that's taking advantage of it, not just the technology component that perhaps makes it such that it's possible in the first place. And so my point is, is that we can talk about the foundations. That's a cyber war. That's a conflict between and amongst bits. We can talk about the strategic leverage you get by that direct abstraction into the critical systems that we depend upon around the world. But the most important thing that's held at bay here, that's held at risk here, is the strategic effect that it has on societies. 
The Russians didn't need to steal a single vote. They didn't need to succeed in stealing one single vote all across 2016 to create the effect that they've helped create. Now, we were kind of a, a ready-made target, but they didn't need to do any of that stuff on levels one and two. They simply needed to essentially invest enough effort to achieve the strategic effect that they did at level three. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about two things, and then I'm going to go to solution space, and then I think we'll have something to think about. You can either attack me on the lawn or back in here during questions and answers. Um, but first and foremost, as you'll hear from Bill Perry next week, he's an extraordinary speaker. Um, he knows, he, he has the depth of expertise on so many strategic activities that I think he'd be more than pleasantly surprised. And one of the things he's particularly good at, he is one of the creators of, is strategic nuclear deterrence which essentially says that if nuclear weapons are a dominant offensive force, meaning that when you use them, you simply dominate, you essentially obliterate the opposition, um, then we have to have a strategy for dealing with those. There are some who would say that cyberspace constitutes an opportunity to take all of those hard-won theoretical concepts and bring those into this space. I, I'm not of that camp, and I don't think he is either. I would say that whereas nuclear weapons are dominant, cyber weapons, the sorts of things that I would, talk, that I would tell you about, they're persistent. Right? They essentially persist, but they're not dominant. Right? And there's this interplay between defense and offense that's more like a scrum than it is this overwhelming overmatch of a tsunami wave coming ashore. And therefore, with that kind of caution in hand, I'm going to extract some of the concepts from nuclear deterrence theory to say these things just might help us. And as in um, traditional deterrence or defense theory, you have to first figure out what it is you're trying to defend. You have a good sense as to what it is you care about, what you hold near and dear, such that you would say, I'm willing to invest some time and energy defending that. Now back to my earlier, my first slide, where I said, you know, we're defending the wrong thing at the wrong time. Many companies, many organizations, many nations have no idea what they're trying to defend. They're trying to defend bits, they're trying to defend links, they're trying to defend devices. That's not at all the case. They're trying to defend the abstraction of that, which might be the critical capabilities, or hopefully more importantly, they're trying to defend their strategic equities. That's the focus, that's got to be the goal. And so you need to first and foremost think, what are my strategic aims? and then map those back down into these bits count, these don't, right? Some of these things you don't need to defend. Sony Pictures trying to defend some of those emails, if you're familiar with the case, it's a fool's chase. They shouldn't have written those emails in the first place, right? Those things were just shameful. Not, not that any of us, you know, haven't thought about writing emails like that, but the fact that you did and then you're trying to defend them, it's a fool's chase. So the foundation is always define, declare your priorities. That has two beneficial effects. It motivates your own efforts. You kind of spend those in a priority-wise, efficient fashion. And it also declares to those that you would perhaps send notice to, hey, th I care about this, and you're on notice that if you hold this at risk, I'm going to care about this, I'm going to come after you. If you make no statement whatsoever, then you confuse at best your adversary. They're like, hey, you don't care. The Chinese might say to us, you put all of this critical information on your unclassified networks? I thought you wanted me to have it. I just, I took a copy, I left the original, trust me. All right, the original blueprints are all still there. We're, we're good, right? All right? These copies are free. Um, that's nonsense, but we never declared that in the first place. Building on top of that, however, we have to actually make sure that the architecture is, in fact, defensible, that it's resilient. Now, the kind of traditional what's called information assurance methods, people who invest in software and hardware and the definition of doctrine procedures, this is well-worked territory. Computer scientists have been doing this forever. Make a defensible architecture. But it turns out that's not enough. You have to actually exercise some vigilance. You have to actually defend it. Those are two different things. Having a defensible house with locks and doors and proper windows and perhaps a fence does you no good whatsoever if you leave the door open, if you go away for great stretches of time with the lights on and the curtains open, with the kind of most valuable assets sitting up there on the mantelpiece. You know, having a defensible house has to go hand in glove with actually defending it. In so many cases in cyberspace, we think, well, we've got a system that can defend itself. Right? We've invested all the necessary hardware, software, stuff. We leave on a Friday, we leave the system wide open, come back on a Monday, and we wonder why there's the equivalent of virtual broken glass all over the floor, because it wasn't defended. We weren't exercising vigilance. And you have to presume breach. You have to presume these things are not defensible in, in the absolute, that at best they are defensible, but weak, kind of perhaps porous vessels, that something's gonna get inside, and you need to find it inside as much as you need to look for it coming over the berm. I have three children. I love them all dearly. I have one of each. One of them is a submarine officer. <laughs> one of them is a submarine officer, broke my heart, right? He was accepted at the United States Air Force Academy, accepted at the United States Naval Academy. I'm bragging to my friends, this kid's going to the Air Force Academy, how cool is that? And he goes to the Naval Academy. Um, and, and graduating at the Naval Academy, he decides he wants to kind of be lower and slower, so he's now driving a submarine. 
<clears throat> right? So, so he's out there in submarines. And he calls me at some point in the midst of this experience. He's still out there somewhere west of Guam. And he says, Dad, there are two things you need to know about submarines. Since you've been asking me all these, you know, these awful questions you know, about the nature of my choices, two things you need to know about submarines. I said, what are they? He said, the first thing is the submarine's trying to kill us. I said, oh, that's great. I said, what's that all about? I won't share that with your mother, but what do you mean by that? And he goes, well, there's a nuclear reactor on board. All U.S. submarines have nuclear reactors. They're fueled for 30 years. There's a nuclear reactor on board. It's a very cramped, tight space. It's like being in a dark space with whirring machines 24 hours a day. You get more than 50, 100 feet underwater, and they usually go much deeper than that. A pinhole leak will take your arm off at a distance of five yards. Right? So it's a very dangerous place. I said, well, that's, that's terrific. Um, I said, so what's the second thing? And he goes, it's our home. He said, we strapped this thing on. I've got a rack on board. It's not worth, you know, kind of a, a mangy dog some time. But, but we have these racks. We live on this thing. We bring food aboard. And we go out there, and we outwit, outmaneuver. We're more agile than our adversaries in that space for four or five months at a stretch. When we go below the surface of that water, we're out there four or five months at a time. Think about reconciling those two concepts. An inherently dangerous, imperfect, you know, not perfectly fit for purpose platform, but it is an amazing machine, right? It's an extraordinary machine. But think about reconciling that to, but we strap this thing on anyway, and we use this, and we're going to be more agile, more, more audacious than our adversaries in that space. That's cyberspace. It's never going to meet our expectations. It cannot be secured. It'll never be perfect for all the reasons that we've discussed so far. But if we understand those deficiencies down to the deck plate, and we say, I'm going to strap this thing on, I'm going to be more audacious, I'm going to outwit, outmaneuver, take all of the reasonable precautions, but at the same time not be deterred in undertaking what I've got to go do, we'll be fine. We'll be just fine. I'll come back to that in a moment. The next level of this is an act of defense, meaning that you need to actively counter adversaries coming at you. And this is where it deters or it departs you know, from traditional nuclear theory. Nuclear theory says, at all costs, we need to prevent the use of these things in the first place. This presumes that people are going to make use of this, and you need to therefore check them at every turn. This is almost like the broken pain theory of, of policing, which is um, if you've declared that something matters to you, if you've actually been vigilant enough about understanding what's happening on your networks, you then need to make sure that when somebody crosses or approaches that line, that some necessary and proportionate action takes place. And absent that, you will either confuse them or perhaps kind of give away those things that are hard won and invested in the infrastructure itself. And then and only then, I'll say that again, then and only then are you in a position where you can impose a consequence on an adversary. Now, I'm co-leading a study at this moment in time for the Defense Department trying to figure out how do we impose consequences on adversaries in and through cyberspace, right? That's a necessary thing, I think, to have in your arsenal. But in this space, as much as in all others, that must be a consequence, an extension of the defense, as opposed to the first thing you do. Because if it's the first thing you do, you're in a glass house to begin with, right? Turns out the infrastructure that you would hold at risk by imposing consequences on somebody is the very same one that your friends, allies, family are using. Um, and it turns out that those things that you would use against them can immediately be picked up and used back against you. So the model has to work in the direction that I've indicated. Now you would see that something just came into view on the right side. Those are important. If we talk about classic deterrence, deterrence by denial, meaning that I'm going to deny you the opportunity to take advantage of me because it's just going to be harder for you to do than you had imagined. The cost is going to be too high. My resilience, my robustness, my locks, my doors, my, my fences, are going to be just too hard for you to get by. That's classic deterrence. And frankly, if you're practicing that, you don't care who's coming at you, right? They, they essentially self-deter because they're not willing to bear that cost. The top of this is deterrence by cost imposition. You have to at that moment, if you're going to go out and kind of smoke someone and pose a consequence, you have to know something about who they are. Which is why on the left side, I put these two, which is that only in these top layers do you require actual detection or the attribution of some action to somebody. These are the classic delimiters that people point out when they say we can't defend ourselves in this space because attribution is just so darn hard. Nonsense. Right? So if you make this sufficiently resilient, sufficiently robust, you don't care who it is that failed in their hack last night, failed in their attempt last night. And I would tell you that at the technical level, if there are three things that we would do that we would deter by, by essentially denial, the vast majority of act actors in this space, and they are to a technologist, you know, reasonable segmentation of fire breaks built into the infrastructure, two-factor authentication, meaning it's not just passwords that essentially extend privilege. You gotta have some physical token. Um, and then finally, the management of privilege broadly across these networks, right? The suppression of privilege where it's not necessary. If you did those three things, and most technologists, yeah, but they're hard and people don't find them to be very popular, we'd get rid of 85% of the problem. We'd be left with just the folks that are trying to challenge us at the top of that model. 
But let's talk about something more fun, more insightful, and, and perhaps then go to a wrap up so that we can get out in the lawn and perhaps have a further discussion. I'm gonna talk about the curious case of Finland. Uh, there's a fellow, I think his name is Reed Standish, who wrote this delightful article in political.com um, in March of this year, and I just loved it. When I read it, I thought, that's it. Right? This is something that we need to embrace and take advantage of, thinking back to what happened to us in the year 2016. And the article opines, um, the Russians are coming after the Finns just like they're coming after everybody else in this space. They're practicing information war. That goes back to the days of the Soviet Union and, and earlier. They're practicing information war against them. Why are the Finns not particularly perturbed or per per particularly at risk from that? Um, the author goes on to say three reasons. Right? The first reason is that the Finns have lead, lived cheek by jowl alongside the Russians forever, right? literally forever. Right? And, and so they are well practiced discriminating um, as to what is a Russian and what isn't. You have to work really hard to look like something other than a Russian if you live in that neighborhood because they know what they look like. That, that experience matters. Right? They, paid, they paid a lot of time and attention to that. More importantly, the Finns have arguably one of the best, Dartmouth accepted, one of the best education systems on the planet. They teach their kids how to do what's called critical thinking. Now, now that's a lost art in the United States, but, but critical thinking essentially goes something like this, which is don't just repeat something back to me, don't just give me the creed, the credo, the recitation, I wanna know why you think that, I wanna know what your facts are, and I want you to reconcile not just the facts you find convenient, but all of the available facts. Give that back to me in that way, such that I can know that what you've said has a foundation of a comprehensive fact base. Think of how unusual that is in the United States today, but they teach their kids in Finland to do just that. And the third thing is, and this is the most important of all, is what the Finns do, is they essentially say, we're not gonna wait for the Russians, right? We've got better things to do. We've got our own message, we've got our own game. The government goes to great pains to say, these are our strategic objectives, and they communicate those every way they can, whether that's by action, whether that's in the written word, the spoken word, and the collaborative actions that take place across a relatively compact society, 5.6 million people. But nonetheless, the Finns are moving at speed against their own objectives. So if you're a Russian, it's really a bad day for you, because if you're a Russian, you've got to get over these three things. You've got to first catch the Finns. You've got to get up to the speed with them. You've got to look like something other than a Russian. And you have to make the case, get past the critical thinking skills. You have to make the case that based on facts that you've got something worth considering. This is not about knocking down the other guy's message. This is not about saying, I'll just score the message. And that, that, that way, people will naturally know that this is worth listening to. This isn't. This is about forming your own message. This is about the need for leadership, the need for a positive, compelling, motivating force that hand in glove with your ability to defend against the other message essentially makes it such that you prevail with your own message. Back to my story about we could go after the German system in World War II, but unless we had a system and were more audacious about the prosecution of a good defense, about an ardent strategy forward, right, we're always gonna find that the best we can do is break even and most days we're losing. So let's talk a little bit about wrapping this up. Um, first principles at the foundational level, I would say that this is not a technology issue, that this is foremost, first and foremost, this is an operational issue. And, and if you're in business, the private sector, the government, or if you just have a household, you need to think about these following things. Roles and expectations are absolutely essential. We can talk more about this in the Q&A. Second, more importantly, across jurisdictions, if convergence and collision is the reality of cyberspace, what I've described to you absolutely is a convergence of technology, a collision of ideology, and perhaps the mishmash of the person, the technology, and the expectations in that space, then integration and collaboration have to be a component of our response. We're gonna be picked apart individually unless we collaboratively get our act together. We have to automate, use technology to our benefit to the extent that that's helpful, but bottom line, we're gonna to have to deal with imperfection. Think of the subdrivers and adversarial action. We're gonna actually kind of apply human effort in this space in a collaborative fashion in order to prevail. And then finally, last chart, we have to engage in critical thinking. The conflict of ideas that is a bedrock of our society is still one of our best ideas. But if we allow that to be a conflict of people, we're lost. And think of in how many situations, whether it's this one or others, where we've essentially gone beyond a conflict of ideas, meritorious, and to a conflict of people. The idea might be stupid, but the person isn't, right? And so we need to, especially in this space, as the private sector and the public sector, as governments pull, try to figure out how they deal with this space, not so much accuse, but say, I need to collaborate with you in some way, shape, or form. Bigger momentum resilience is gonna be the thing that puts the adversary in the defensive. We're not gonna steal the initiative back from them unless we have our own speed. Think of the Finns, gotta catch me first. And then finally, collaborate within, across, and between because diversity beats audacity every time. 
Diversity is an enormous strength if it's formed on common ground and if unifying this, say, you're gonna have to beat all of us, and we've got one of every one of us in the room, you have to beat all of us if you're gonna beat any one of us. And we've got to do that as much or more as anything else. So I know I've expanded uh, the briefing, perhaps, perhaps beyond what's required. I think that uh, it's about 10.10 at this moment in time. The doors are open, the lawn awaits. I'm happy to take questions individually, but we'll be back here in a better part of 20 minutes to start our Q&A. Thanks. Well, that certainly was a lot to absorb. Unfortunately, it accurately describes the nature, complexity, opportunity, and threat that confronts us today in the ever-expanding cyberspace world. The communications and information technologies that make up cyberspace are universally available to every nation in the world. And they are easily weaponized to enable intrusions that can bring down our national infrastructure. A cyber weapon has no mushroom cloud and it is impervious to the classical geographic boundaries and defenses we have become accustomed to over time. Fortunately, presentations such as that made by Chris Inglis have resulted in a call for national action. The Congressional National Defense Authorization Act of 2019 created the United States Cyberspace Solarium Commission to directly address the cyberspace challenges facing the United States. The commission <clears throat> made up of national cyber experts and key legislators was charged to construct a strategy and ensure a course of action that will result in policies and legislation to develop an effective cyberspace defense for the United States. And not surprisingly, Chris Inglis was asked to be one of the commissioners. The Cyberspace Commission's report was released in March of this year. You can view it by Googling the United States Cyber Solarium Commission report. The report pulls no punches and starts right out by saying that our country <clears throat> is at risk not only from the catastrophic cyber attack, but from millions of daily intrusions disrupting everything from financial transactions to the inner workings of our electoral systems and even to our personal communications, should they find them interesting. I highly recommend you download that report and read at least the chairman's letter and the executive summary. You have a good deal at stake in cyberspace and you need to understand that. Thank you for joining us today. And I hope you found the presentation most interesting and provocative. We're looking forward to you returning to us again for another presentation from our 2017 summer lecture series. Thank you for being here and have a good day.